this is this is a fun fun topic for me not unlike last week's topic church history from the big bang to today in 60 minutes did it in 68 uh, last week we'll, we'll do you know can refine a little bit more next time this one um is integral spirituality which is more or less the history of the evolution of human consciousness last week's is kind of intimidating to me to teach in a fun way because it's trying to cover an awful lot of material at a high altitude in a way that's hopefully relatable and interesting um, in a short period of time. This, this today's topic is as intimidating and challenging and interesting and fun to me as last week's. It's a, it's a smaller period of time, so it's 300 to 500,000 years, which is still a pretty big slice of time. Um, but it's trying to talk about it. Today's topic is trying to talk about a map that's even more sort of got fewer handles on it in a sort of a way because we're talking about consciousness. Um, yeah, but I think it's so important and helpful to our spiritual lives to talk about this integral map um, that I teach it to, to folks who are new to the church. I do that very much on purpose because I think it's a really helpful lens to look through. Uh, I do not proclaim that everything I say today is unchanging, dogmatic, objective truth. <laughs> this is a map of human consciousness among many maps. It's a developmental map that has a lot of scientific data, sociological and archaeological and developmental work behind it that supports it. But one of our one of our teachers, a man named Ken Wilbur, a philosopher named Ken Wilbur, says, um, most all maps are good until the next one comes along, which is great, right? I mean, yeah, I mean, the, the, even, the, even the maps, although we might have maps of streets down to a lot of precision, but, you know, b before um, Google came along, maybe, even maps of streets and rivers and uh, mountains, of course, rivers and mountains change, don't they? I mean, in other words, maps really are good until the next one comes along. This has been the history of maps. And my expectation in the evolving universe, which we kind of argued for last week, is that new and better and more informed maps will continue to come along, um, which I think is exciting. Last week's class, um, as science and mathematics and physics and astrophysics and quantum physics and quantum chemistry advance, Man, that lecture will change, right? That presentation, the details in it, which to me lights me up because I fundamentally believe that evolution is a theological word in as much as it's the drive shaft that God is using and has been using for 14 billion years uh, to help us all grow. And this grand project of the, I mean this word kind of poetically and theologically, and the grand project of the perfection of the universe as we journey more and more um, into more refined expressions and manifestations of the good and the true and the beautiful. Yeah. So today it is a look at the history of the evolution of consciousness. We're gonna place ourselves on this map first as a way in. So this is a map of the church year. New Year's Day of the church year is the first Sunday in Advent season, right? said this every week, and the end of the church year is way down there in early or mid-winter, mid-November maybe, um, All Saints Day and then Christ the King. And do you remember that the church year is a series, a rhythm rather, two words, they start with an F, each of them does, it's a feast. fasting and feasting, excellent. We fast to prepare for the feast, so the fast that we're in right, or in right now is Lent, the fast that begins the year is Advent, which prepares us for the feast of Christmas. We're then in the in the feast, the fasting season of Lent, which prepares us for the feast of Easter, and by extension, the feasting season of Easter. Easter is the longest feasting season of the year at 50 days. It's also unique and wonderfully so, in as much as Easter season begins with a feast and it ends with a feast. Pentecost is a big feast day of the church it's where we celebrate the gift of the Holy Spirit, which is depicted in the early books of the Acts of the Apostles, a New Testament um, book in the Bible. So I'll open us with the collect for the day. Remember what collect means? It means literally what? 
collect, good, to collect. In the Episcopal Church, we like to um, say words in a fancy way, because that's just how we roll. It's all good. So collect is how we say it, but what it does is collect the themes of the day, that it gathers up the themes of the day. So if you've got a prayer book, I'm on page 219, the collect appointed for today, the fourth Sunday in the season of Lent. So in the Episcopal Church, when the preacher or the one who's up praying says, the Lord be with you, the people say, and also with you, good. So the Lord be with you. Let us pray. Gracious Father, whose blessed Son, Jesus Christ, came down from heaven to be the true bread, which gives life to the world. Evermore give us this bread that he may live in us and we in him, who, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. 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 All right. So you've got a handout, but before we get onto your handout, I'm going to do a little bit of setup to get us to about... 3,000, 300,000 years ago. All right. So to get to get to where consciousness begins, we think, we'll start 13.8 billion years ago with the birth of the what? It starts with a U. Universe with the, in the Big Bang. We're then going to jump way ahead to something that is, we're, we're uh, thinking about ourselves, to something that's crucial to our own lives. Y'all remember, this is kind of a pop quiz, sorry. Y'all remember what happened, what was born five billion years ago? Earth. Close. Close. Clue. What was born five billion years ago is, yes, is halfway through its life and it's crucial to our life. The sun. The sun was born about five billion years. Everything is give or take 500 to uh, 500 billion to a billion years. So the sun is born um, five billion years ago or so. And then real close, um, is the Earth at 4.6, you know, give or take half a billion. Um, so this is the first of the Big Bang, the first Big Bang, right? This is the second Big Bang. You remember what it is? Life. Right, good, Evie, life. So about three and a half billion years ago, this what, what we call it poetically, right? What we call poetically... Um, is the second Big Bang, it's three and a half billion years ago. So this comes out of nothing, and then this life doesn't come out of nothing so much as it comes out of inanimacy. I think I just made that word up. As there was no life, and then by some strange miracle, there's life. So what happens is, you remember the, the, the main thing that was present after the Big Bang in the universe was hydrogen a little bit of helium, and a really little bit of lithium. So what we say is it turns out, if you take a lot of hydrogen, a little bit of helium, and even a smaller amount of lithium, and you leave them alone for about 10 billion years, you get the beginnings of Charlie, and Paul, and Eve, and Elizabeth, Amy, Brian, and Alexa Lee. So life begins, tiny little bacterial type life. Then 5 million, so we jumped forward, you know, three and a half, almost three and a half billion years, because five million against three and a half billion is nothing. Five million years ago, you remember what happens? On planet Earth, our earliest primate ancestors show up in the fossil record. Right? Not Homo sapiens. Then 500 to 300,000 years ago, Homo sapiens show up in the fossil record. And you remember this, these, when you get, when you get into these numbers here, the fossil record changes the, the dating of it pretty consistent. I mean, you can, on any, I think these days, on any given day, in this record, on any given day, you can Google um, Homo sapiens origin and you'll find, oh, well, they just discovered something and, you know, West Africa that's, that we've never seen before, and it sort of moves a date or clarifies a date around this. Suffice it to say, 500 to 300,000 years ago, Homo sapiens, more Homo sapiens, right, show up on planet Earth as evidenced by the fossil record. Okay. So, in our earliest stage, our consciousness is not developed very much at all relative to how it is developed 
in us right this second. Right this second, I fully understand an awful lot about the people and objects in this room and my relation to them. I know what is edible and what is not edible. I know what's a danger to me, what's not a danger to me. I know it's a symbol for something else. I know that a phone number, of a particular sequence put into that phone on the wall, we actually have a phone on the wall back there still, gets me to a, like my consciousness is really developed. In the earliest stages of our earliest ancestors, consciousness is not very developed at all. I have an enormous value set right now. In the earliest stages, there is no value set other than it's good, the value is good, if I find something to eat today and find another creature with whom to mate. I mean, these are literally 300,000 years ago, uh, sort of major mechanics of our consciousness. We have a little bit of a dawning self-awareness in the earliest days where we begin to understand homo sapiens do that we're other than our surroundings and each other, but it is very primitive. This is what we would call the archaic stage of consciousness. You know, 100 to 300,000 years ago, I just put 250 up here as a kind of medium number. <clears throat> Along the way, we develop um, an increased consciousness, Homo sapiens do, and we become a tribal people where we're no longer a solitary cave person in a solitary cave, but we band together in family groups. Tribal, still very primitive. <clears throat> What's evidenced in this early piece here is that there's growth and development. And the tribal stage of consciousness, um, the world is an enchanted place. Uh, magical thinking. Think little children who believe in the tooth fairy, which is great, and Santa Claus, and have a magical sense of all of their surroundings. This is our early tribal ancestors some 50,000 years ago. As time passes, <clears throat> our tribal ancestors grow out of the clans in which they're living. They realize that they have um, a strength beyond the clan. The other thing that happens with our tribal ancestors as they grow in population, my family group grows from two to four to six to eight to 12, whatever, as they start bumping into their neighbors. And when I start bumping into my neighbors, I start competing with my neighbors for resources, all manner of resources. And what awakens is this warrior consciousness, which comes online about 15,000 years ago. And the warrior consciousness realizes that it is not simply, um, that human beings are not simply relegated to the norms and strictures and confinements of their families and their clans, but that each individual has strength unto his or herself and can exercise that strength um, against one's neighbors. And fighting, fight makes, let's see, might makes right becomes, um, comes online and becomes a way, among others, to relate to my neighbors. So this, think Vikings, right? Think um, warlords and common culture, think gangs. I mean, a contemporary culture, rather. This stage of consciousness stays online um, for 10,000 years, comes online 15,000 years ago, and stays online for, for 10 to, to 15,000 years. So this is just the earliest stages of the evolution of human consciousness, starting 500 to 300,000 years ago. And in the fossil record, we can see these changes taking place in human communities and conclude that consciousness is changing. 
each level of consciousness has um, its dignities and its disasters. It has gifts and shadows, upside and downside. The warrior stage of consciousness has an upside, um, which is that it can protect itself. It's a people who can protect themselves from danger. It's also a people who have an extraordinary loyalty to their tribe. When we bump up against our neighbors, uh, the neighbors are loyal to their kin and we're loyal to our kin. So an upside is loyalty. An upside is the realizing that as an individual, I have strength. And a downside is violence and chaos. One of the primary rules or sort of guiding lights of the evolution of consciousness is that each stage of consciousness comes online in response to the problems or needs of the world in which the people live. So warrior stage of consciousness came online because in the tribal stage of consciousness, we were bumping up against each other. There, there were too many people. And also the tribe was too restrictive. So warrior stage, you can think of um, like a teenager who's rebelling from his or her family household. This is too restrictive. And I live with a teenager now. There's not enough room in this place. So each stage of consciousness comes online in response to the life conditions of the present moment. So we have a long time here, 10, 15,000 years, where might makes right, and there's just this hyper-competitive atmosphere among human beings on the planet. Every stage begins to exit to the next stage according to the problems that arise in that stage. And the problem, the a primary problem that arises in the warrior stage is that it's too violent. We cannot sustain this. And it's too chaotic. What do we believe in? This tribe believes in one thing. This tribe believes in another thing. This tribe believes in another thing. There's a chaos of belief as well. So about 5,000 years ago, another stage of consciousness comes online. We refer to it as the traditional stage of consciousness. The chief value in the traditional stage of consciousness is law and order. Another way to describe the values of the traditional stages of consciousness are heritage. Now, can you see how law and order and heritage deal with the violence and chaos of the previous stage? It's, it's too violent to stay in warrior stage. So consciousness evolves to discover that we need some structure. Law and order is just a shorthand way to put it. It's such a chaotic belief system. And it's a belief system that grows out of this magical thinking tribal stage becomes chaotic. So there's a heritage that develops in human consciousness, consciousness um, that gives a sort of uniformity within uh, neighborhoods of human culture of belief. Now, there's a couple of things that really um, helped the traditional stage of agriculture. That's an L. Um, Help the traditional stage of consciousness come online. One is agriculture, and the other is the alphabet. And then build on the alphabet, and you have writing. So you remember um, in, in, the, in last week's class, we said that civilization was born about 10,000 years ago. So the traditional stage of consciousness is sort of the peak in the development that results from civilizations coming online. So agriculture um, means that we have more stability because we can grow our own food. We don't have to move around for a long time. And if we can grow it, we can store it. Um, the alphabet means that we don't have to, um, and writing means that we don't have to pass everything on by oral tradition. 
We can now write it down. Heritage is the chief value. So my, um, uh, I can write down what we believe and I can pass it on to Charlie. And Charlie can pass it on to Brian. We can pass it on to the next generation and the next generation. We get a lot more order, right? We can deal with the chaos by coming up with, and the violence by coming up with law. Our people do this. Our people don't do this. This is out of bounds. This is in bounds. And when you do something that's out of bounds, there is a punishment. We develop a rewards punishment system and the traditional stage of consciousness. Now, this is a really important stage for Christians because it tells us an awful lot about our own scriptural heritage. Now, I want you to think about the Old Testament of the Bible. And in the Old Testament, once you get past the creation story, once you get past, um, well, past the creation story, it starts automatically in, in the Adam and Eve story. You can see in our Old Testament story that story after story after story is drawing up black and white. Do this, don't do this. And in the earliest part of it, it's stories that draw up black and white rules. And then not too, um, not too far in, we get rules. We get the Ten Commandments. We get all the 600 plus laws of the Jewish people recorded um, in Leviticus and Deuteronomy. We get over and over again the Israelites being pointed towards the one true God. Moses said, as for me and my household, we will, Joshua said this rather, Moses probably did too, as for me and my household, we will serve the one true God. Choose this day who you will serve. And what that is a response to is the chaos and the violence of the warrior stage. There are too many gods. There's too many pagan gods. There's no rules about anything. There's magical thinking that guides all of our um, all of our belief. It's not grounded in a foundational place necessarily that can has any chance of becoming universal and uniform. And so the Old Testament, which sometimes frustrates contemporary folks like us, like, God, the rules, are you serious? It's for a purpose. It is dealing with this violence and chaos. So if you're, if, if you're raising a kid or if you're someone who was raised by parents, I think everybody's probably raised by parents, there was a point in your life early or sort of mid to late adolescence maybe or early adolescence where you just had rule after rule after rule after rule. If you don't clean the dishes or make your bed or lock the front door when you come in or you know whatever it is, um, these are the consequences. What that is doing is dealing with the chaos of your three-year-old or four-year-old self. Three-year-olds and four-year-olds are wonderful, but it's a pretty chaotic existence. Can I get an amen? I mean, isn't that right, Charlie? You have a, you have a young child. Yeah. yeah. So that's what, that's what the traditional stage is doing. The Bible was born in the traditional stage. And almost, I would say, maybe, maybe sort of early peak traditional stage. So the Old Testament... Um, so this is traditional stage comes online 5,000 years ago. The Old Testament is born um, about 4,000 years ago, three to 4,000 years ago. 2,000 years ago is Jesus, right? And then the, most of the Old Testament, the record is of about 1,000 to 1,500 years before that. So you can see how the Old Testament comes out of this stage of consciousness. This stage of consciousness keeps, you know, is, is a, really most of our our contemporary history. Um, this stage of consciousness, some, some kind of uh, archetypes of this stage, stage of consciousness would be the British monarchy, you know, very hierarchical, very orderly. Does that make sense? Um, uh, uh, the Roman Catholic Church, very structured, very hierarchical, very black and white. Do this, don't do this. Here's who in, who's in charge. There's a hierarchy. There's a top of the hierarchy. There's a bottom of the hierarchy. Uh, the feudal system of, what is that? Uh, mid medieval time would be a great example of law and order heritage. So going further um, with, the, with the way the traditional stage processes life, you have a lot of black and white thinking. You have good and evil as absolutes. There's a clear distinction between good and evil. There's not a lot of gray. Um, what else would we say about traditional stage? It's very ethnocentric, very communal, um, self-sacrifice for the good of the group. 
right? Um, so a lot of patriotism in the traditional stage. And you know people who are very grounded in the traditional stage right now. Uh, you 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 have a lot of grounding in the traditional stage right now, probably. My grandparents died as being having their center of gravity in the traditional stage, and it's wonderful. It's great. There's there's absolutely no problems with it. So I want to kind of press pause on the on the chronological here for a second and talk a little bit about the some basic ground rules or dynamics that are included in the evolution of consciousness and what we call integral theory. And you'll understand why we use the word integral shortly. <clears throat> one, one of the basic principles is that growth happens. Consciousness evolves. Human beings are not static creatures. We're not still in subsistence living, coming out of our caves with entirely focused on what we'll eat and uh, with whom we'll mate, right? We've clearly evolved. Another, another ground rule um, for this sort of stage development is that each stage arises in response to the life conditions which consist of the problems caused by the previous stage. So each stage comes online in response to the problems caused by the previous stage, which are the current life conditions. So you remember the problem caused by the warrior stage is that it's too violent and too chaotic to be sustainable. So it's created a world that is chaotic and violent. So traditional stages come online in response to the life conditions caused by the problems of the warrior stage. As a concept, does that make sense? Another principle building on that, and this is where the trouble begins, is that each stage believes it is the final stage. So traditional stage thinks and believes that it's just better than warrior stage. In a lot of ways it is, and that warrior stage shouldn't exist. And if warrior stage didn't exist at all, wouldn't that be great? I probably walked off the screen here. But the fact is, you can't do away with a previous stage any more than you could take the crawl space out from underneath your house, or the slab out from underneath your house, or the basement out from underneath this church. Do you know what happens if I wave, wave, a, wave a magic wand and get rid of the basement that we're in right now? It all falls apart. So each stage thinks it's the only stage, but it's built on the stage before. That's problematic. That's why when we get to the modern stage and we talk about how my, um, not my parents because they're perfect, but uh, this is recorded and put on the internet. <laughs> but, but like the parent, parents often think of, of their parents, ah, oh, don't even listen to them. They're nothing. But, but that's not true. Without these parents, you can't have these children. Does that make sense? So each stage builds on the one that came before it. Another thing, a principle is that each stage has its dignities. And each stage has its disasters. So the dignity of the traditional stage is that it gave us a belief system that's consistent. In other words, it's got some consistency in it. We don't make up the, or the creation story every time we decide to have a, a faith conversation, right? No, we've got it. It's written down. It's our theology, it's our poetry, it's in the book of Genesis. There's, it's mass produced, it's all over this room, it's all over this church. So the dignity is dignity of the traditional stage is we get some order. We have a heritage. It's less violent because we've got laws that we follow. Dignity. Each stage has a disaster. The disaster of the traditional stage, among the disasters of the traditional stage, is that it's... Um, it consumes the individual. So in the feudal system, for instance, you're just stuck where you're stuck where you're stuck where you're stuck. Um, the British monarchy, if we're honest, I'm not trying to hate on the British monarchy, but if we're honest, feels a little arbitrary these days. I mean, if we're honest, they, they, just, they just won and that got handed down. So there, that hierarchy that's unchecked, it, it, yeah, there's probably some holes in that. There's probably some shadow to that. Um, 
Self-sacrifice is good for the cause, and I'm a patriotic person. Y'all are probably patriotic people. But um, when my country wants me to do something that's illegal, maybe, or really is fundamentally, morally, ethically unjust, then we ought to be able to question that. Well, in peak traditional state, you can't question that. You just do it. That makes sense? So that's a disaster of the traditional stage. The big one, though, I think disaster of the traditional stage is that I cannot, I as an individual cannot realize my full potential as an individual, as a part of the evolutionary structure of the universe, if I always have to toe the party line. And if I'm a part of a feudal system or a hierarchical system where my people just never get up off the bottom. Now, another thing to say about the stages is that a, this is the this is the one letter. A three-year-old is not a defective ten-year-old. A three-year-old is not a defective ten-year-old. So oh, if someone born in the warrior stage or living in the warrior stage is not a defective traditionalist. They're just this is where they were born. They're just three. Or they're just 10, you know? A 10-year-old is not a defective 17-year-old. Everybody has a right to be where they are on the spiral of development. Okay, so those are some, those are some principles that guide this. All right, so these three are the primary stages that are online on planet Earth today. Today. Okay. Now, if you look at your handout, you'll see that the traditional stage has 30% next to it. So the traditional stage, 30% of the people in our country, the United States of America, are at the traditional stage of consciousness. That means their center of gravity has this value set, the traditional stage value set. These are God and country folks. Patriotic law and order, Bible believing, church going. Thirty percent of the United States is there. These would stereotype some stereotypical um, uh, words you could use would be conservative. And we don't necessarily mean fundamentally pop partisan politics, but that's a piece of it, right? But just a good conservative. Again, my grandparents. My, my grandfather's greatest generation served with distinction in the United States Army for his entire career. I couldn't be prouder of it, right? My, my heritage is built on traditional stage, and yours is too. Okay, so remember the problem that's caused by the traditional stage is um, this subsuming of self. Well, with the European Renaissance and the Enlightenment, the historical seasons in, in our history, right? So three to 500 years ago and the Protestant Reformation, we started to break out of the mold of the traditional stage. Big ticket things we did with scientific discoveries and reasoning, right? Um, Thomas Jefferson is an icon of the modern stage of consciousness. The folks who came from the old world to the so-called new world, so from you know continental and, and English Europe over to you know what we now call North America, they were a lot of them were breaking out of the mold, busting out of the family that was the British monarchy and the Roman Catholic Church. And they came over here to try a new thing, social democracy, right? All men are created equal. Under this system, all men are not created equal. The modern stage comes online, and chief value of the modern stage is liberty, liberty from that which constrained us in the traditional stage, and fairness. And by fairness, we mean people have an opportunity to chart their own path. The playing field is fair. I'm not stuck in a feudal system. I can exercise my agency as a human being. The modern stage, you know, um, gets us capitalism. So capitalism fundamentally as an economic system just says exactly what it means. It's, it tries to provide, and at the early stages, it's, there's a lot of inequities, but it tries to provide access to capital, whether that's money or land or seeds or tractors, some kind of capital 
so that you can start your business and do your thing. That's that's capitalism. There's a freedom, uh, relative freedom, in the marketplace. Modern, the modernist stage of consciousness is very egocentric, and we don't mean that in like narcissistic, but just like ego, like you, the self, um, individualistic. And you'll see on your handout, I have the number fifty percent next to that. 50% of the population of the United States of America today is at the modernist stage of consciousness. So liberty and fairness are key values. Those are dignities. All men are created equal is an early, early expression of li the liberty and fairness values that are um, key values for the modernist stage of culture. Again, think enlightenment, think the beginning of the United States of America. This is a consciousness that was not online earlier. It came online in response to the disasters of the traditional stage of consciousness. Think um, how we got to the moon. It's the modern stage of consciousness that got us vaccines in general and a vaccine to a never before <laughs> no, no, uh, uh, virus in less than a year. That's the genius of the modern stage of consciousness. Think Elon Musk, no matter what you think about him, he built a Tesla baby and he takes normal, not normal people, he takes non-astronauts to space, right? I'm not, I'm not taking a position on his, his views or anything like that, but he sort of embodies modern consciousness, mathematics, physics, chemistry, modern consciousness, scientific method and reasoning. When you think about liberty and fairness, um, the early framers of our country said all men are created equal, and they were starting down a path, right? Um, they were right, but it was incomplete because they didn't include women, and they didn't include black men, for instance. They had a, they had a, a really expansive view of liberty, but even as expansive as it was, it was limited. So point to make here is that within each stage of consciousness, you find tons of growth. So in this stage of consciousness, all over planet Earth, slavery exists. And it is um, condoned, if not supported and encouraged by nation states. That makes sense? Countries, have as a policy, you can own another human being. In the modern stage of consciousness, so three to 500 years ago, we start off with slavery being a thing that's sanctioned by nation states. That makes sense? Uh, let's see. From I'm going to use round numbers, and you can correct me, and I'll concede all of your points, right? But from about 1750 to about 1875, so a little bit more than a 100-year period of time, which is very fast when you consider the uh, 14 billion year evolutionary history of the universe, slavery as a state-sanctioned thing was outlawed all over planet Earth. Where were we? We're about 1865, so we're here at the tail end. We together, Civil War. So we go from all men are created equal, 1776, is that right? To, well, about 100 years later. Slavery as a state-sanctioned practice is banished all over planet Earth. Now, some of my friends say, Henry, there's still slavery. You're totally wrong. There's slavery today. Absolutely. Totally agree with you. Human trafficking, I mean, we, we raise awareness for human trafficking, right, in Lexington. Absolutely, there's still slavery. What we're saying in the modern stage of consciousness is state-sanctioned, right? Officially state-sanctioned slavery. That's just one example. In 1920, who got the right to vote in our country? Women. Women. Right, so you can see the progress we're making. Okay, so dignities. You got this progress, and the progress continues. And we're not done. We're evolutionaries, right? Okay, disaster. Disaster of the modern stage of consciousness. Uh, also think industrial revolution here, right? Um, disaster of this modern stage of consciousness is it actually creates some really gross inequalities and inequities. Capitalism is a is a, a really helpful drive shaft um, for global economics, but it also creates some gross inequalities. We have 
billionaires, right? Well, if we've got billionaires, there's a bunch of people who ain't got much money. Does that, does that kind of make sense? Uh, we've got superpowers, right? So, so the modern stage of consciousness creates great wealth, but it also results in, in great pockets of wealth that are consecrated, consecrated, not consecrated, concentrated with small groups or individuals. Does that make sense? So there's inequities that arise. What is one of the disasters of the Industrial Revolution? We are fouling the nest. Pollution. The Industrial Revolution is great. I mean, it created, created a, a great uh, amount of growth. I mean, again, vaccines, you wouldn't argue with it. Birth, uh, let's see, oh, hey, birth rate mortality. I don't think I'm saying that right. But anyway, we can keep babies alive. Um, we still have lots of problems, but we have incredible advances, right? We also have enormous pollution. Uh, planet seems to be warming. Uh, ozone has. Remember, when we got ozone last week. We got ozone O3. Uh, well, that's you know we can apparently poke holes in that with the way we're polluting um, the planet. So we're sort of fouling the nest. Um, also, modernism, the modern stage of consciousness, create it. It creates persecution. Um, the, the, Human sexual trafficking is possible because of the modern stage of consciousness. Now that happens about here too, but it's possible in large scale through the internet and these sorts of things because of modern consciousness. So that really is uh, a degrading disaster. So modern consciousness um, creates life conditions that make uh, human consciousness and the human community fertile ground for growth. Our laws protect black people from being owned as property, but our laws do not really take care of black people. So in the 1960s, progressivism comes online in full, um, sort of full bloom, full, full early bloom, full early bloom. Chief value of progressivism is caring, compassion. We care about each other and the planet. Um, we get rid of. We we start to really in earnest get rid of Jim Crow. Uh, I know you can't own black people, but why do they have to drink from a different water fountain? Think Martin Luther King Jr. Um, think the questions that come up about things like the Vietnam War. We have this expansive sense of caring for the people we have freed. We have an expansive sense of caring for the earth and each other. It's out of progress, the progressive stage of consciousness, consciousness that comes online in the 1960s that we get... Um, the early roots of things like looking at systemic problems. The inequities of the traditional and modern stages have left their prints on human culture, and we have systemic issues. We have systemic racism. We have the um, rippling effects of these earlier stages. In the progressive stage, we what comes online in spirituality is a plural, pluralistic or pluralism, an appreciation for other religions. It's not just about my tribe. What do the Buddhists have to say? Um, those feel like some dignities of the progressive stage. Disasters of the progressive stage are pluralism with no truth. So a disaster of the progressive stage is a gross relativism. What's truth? Whatever you think it is. Well, as we grow and mature, that's actually not true. Because if I think truth is murdering you in the name of God or my religion, well, that's not true. There are some absolutes. You should not take the life of another person. So there grows in the progressive stage a sort of gross relativism or pluralism that is not helpful. The other, another disaster of the progressive stage is um, 
an allergy, as it were, to objectivity, which means that most mostly I look through the lens of my subjective experience, which mostly mean which means I mostly take my points of view and my stances on issues by how I feel about them. And that's good. It's good to have an emotional feeling capacity. But if I'm totally allergic to objectivity and entirely invested in subjectivity, I'm kind of back to the chaos, not violent. Like I'm not going to kill you over it, but it's a rather chaotic um, way to live. And everything is just how I feel about it. And I create a field in which everybody just tell me how you feel about it. And that's what we'll do. Well, show me where that gets anything done. That, that sort of makes sense. So I just feel like um, the earth is being polluted to the nth degree. And so then I respond to these folks based out of my feelings. One of the things that um, uh, modernism does with its scientific reason is gets rid of all the myths of religion, which is damaging. We need mythos. We need an enchanted universe, right? Um, one of the things that progressivism does is tell modernism that it's just all wrong. Tweets it on an iPhone, which modernism gave it. Does that make sense? So baby and bathwater are all out in the street. Okay. Uh, modernism, okay, so I said 30% of the United States is the traditional level. 50%, that's the majority, of the United States is at the modernist level. Um, so that leaves me what? 20%. So 20% of the United States is at the progressive level of consciousness. Now, <clears throat> one of the things that's characteristic of this spiral of development, this, this map, is that the traditional stage and the progressive stage are at war with each other. This is the culture wars, okay? Think... Um, your most liberal leftist progressive is going to vote for Bernie Sanders forever and ever and ever and ever. Amen. I'm being silly with a stereotype, right? Progressive stage wants to extinguish my grandparents who think that Ronald Reagan was the best thing that ever happened. I'm not against Ronald Reagan. I'm not against my grandparents. I'm making a silly, um, it's actually not all that silly, but... <laughs> But, you know, to, to make a point, they want to extinguish each other. This is the culture wars, right? Um, they can't do without each other. Without the traditional stage, there is no progressive stage. The progressive stage is so mad at the modern stage for, for what it's done to with systemic issues and to the planet. It wants to get rid of it altogether. And then it definitely also, as I just illustrated, doesn't like the traditional stage, right? So if you get rid of these two stages, who's the progressive stage left with? ISIS just needs to be understood. Do you follow that? Remember ISIS? The warlords in Afghanistan just need to be understood. If we could just tell them how we feel and let them tell us how we they feel, we'd be okay. Does that make sense? progressive stage, and I have a lot of progressive stage in me. I mean, y'all hear me preach today? Love, love, love. Wants to get rid of these two. But the problem is, if you get rid of those two, progressive, all my touchy feely progressive friends are left with the warrior stage folks. And the warrior stage folks will cut your head off. Not, it's not gonna, it's not gonna go well. We need all of these stages online and not fighting Huh? But understanding that each has, each of the others has a right to exist, which brings us to the integral stage. So the, the thing that's unique, see you, Charlie, take care, buddy. The thing that's unique and profoundly helpful about the integral stage of consciousness, which came online. You know, about 50 years ago, maybe, maybe even maybe even less. The thing that's profoundly helpful about the integral stage of consciousness is that it's the first stage of consciousness that understands and believes that the other stages of consciousness exist and have a right to exist. 
So unless you're just in total disagreement with everything that I've said so far, you have an interval capacity in you. If you're just hoping this will be over soon so you can go home and live your life and you're probably changed churches and like this guy's crazy. <laughs> um, if that's the case for you, then then you're you're likely one of these stages. I don't think any of you are. And whatever's beyond your stage, it's not a thing. I just I mean it's just fiction or science fiction, maybe fantasy. The interval stage of consciousness and see its chief its chief characteristics is that it can see the other stages. It can hear a presentation on the evolution of human consciousness and it goes, oh yeah, that makes sense. That explains my conservative friends and my liberal friends. That explains my friends who just want to make a bunch of money and go to the house. That explains my grandparents and my great uncle and my nephew, right? Integral states is, oh my gosh, I get why the Republicans and the Democrats are so frustrating to, to, to me, to everybody, because they're just in this family squabble and can't see that they need each other. At the interval stage, we understand that everybody has a right to be where and who they are. And at the interval stage, we can see the importance of each of these three main stages that are online today, in as much as they're building blocks that got us to where we are right now. So the chief value of the interval stage is that it values all the other stages. It knows, like, like the, the, the part of me that has an integral sensibility knows that I owe an enormous debt to my grandparents. Enormous debt to my mother and father who taught me the prayers of my tradition, who taught me about the prayer book, who taught me the Nicene Creed. To my father, who when I was in my early 20s said, son, go get a study Bible. Read it slowly. Learn the stories of our faith. All grounded in this very black and white concrete traditional stage. And then what value, when I was a young man in a college and I wanted to start a business, what value the economics and finance mentors I had in my life? What value they gave me because they taught me how to balance a checkbook. They taught me the basics of capitalism and how to budget. And uh, that you need to buy a business license and insurance, right? And then you can depreciate the value of pickup trucks and chainsaws and get ahead. And that we live in a country where there's an opportunity to have capital and make something of yourself. I wouldn't get rid of that. And what value my progressive stage mentors have had in my life when they said, hey, being gay is not a choice. Care about these people. Being black is no different from being white. Pigment in your skin. What value when they said, hey, you might, let's talk about recycling. What value when someone said to me, you know, Hendry, not everything is disposable. And the more disposable things we have in our day-to-day, -day, the more junk we put in the oceans. And that affects, and you know, in other words, great. And what value the people who said, don't be scared of Buddhists, be curious about what they're into. Enormous value. And if we'll keep going, it lands us here. Now, I didn't say what the disaster of the progressive stage is that leads to the integral stage. And I think the disaster of the progressive stage is that um, it's, it really is so pluralistic at its worst that there's no truth. And that's just not helpful. Um, there is truth. There is good and beautiful and true. Um, it's also so wedded to subjectivity, how I feel about something, that it becomes hard to function in society. Um, I worry about the words I use because they'll be offensive. For, we're, we're in this sort of cancel culture right now. Well, progressive stage, bless its heart, and I have a lot of that in me. 
we'll get into policing what people say and do to such a degree that now our, some of our smartest people in any given community sort of just sit on their hands like, yeah, I'm not going to run for office or do anything because it's too scary. Does that sort of make sense? And that's because progressive stage has become allergic to objectivity. Objective truth is a thing. Objective truth is an evolving thing as scientific and historical and archaeological progress is made. Venerable says, I see it. Everybody has a right to be where they are. An achievement skill of the integral stage of consciousness is that it uses a um, method that we call transcend and include. One of my teachers calls the, it says we use the judo move of inclusion. Right as we travel along the spiral of development, the transcend and include. Okay, so this is the chief character in the, the interval stage. So as we move from stage to stage, as we grow from stage to stage, we want to transcend the stage that we're leaving. Right, transcend, just move beyond. But we want to transcend and include. So we're going to transcend the traditional stage including as we go all the best parts of it. So I have transcended, I think, the traditional stage as my center, my core center of gravity. But I have included my deep appreciation for all the stories of my Judeo-Christian faith. All of my heritage around behavior and ethic that I get from the Ten Commandments and the story of God relating to God's people in the Old Testament, for instance. Um, I can still say yes, ma'am, and no, ma'am. Yes, sir, and yes, and, and, and no, sir. I know the, the practical things, like I know where the fork goes. I know where the spoon and the knife goes. You know, there's a lot of, I'm a very patriotic guy. I love our country. Our country is amazing. I'm very devoted to my home state of Georgia. Yes, it's in the deep south. Yes, we have our troubles, but that's my home and those are my people. I have transcended the racism that lives in my, you know, in the origin of my home state of the deep south, um, home state of Georgia in the deep south. But I've included the beauty of being devoted to one's family and one's country. Does that make sense? As I, as I move forward into the modern stage. With each stage, we transcend and include, taking with us the best parts of it. By the time we get to the integral stage of consciousness, we can look back and do it two things at least. We can look back and tell the story of our own progression through these stages. Yeah. We can see the progression through these stages uh, in culture, historical uh, stories of culture. Um, yeah, I can tell you about the, the Old Testament history. You all can tell me about Enlightenment, European Renaissance, Protestant Reformation. Uh, then we can all tell the story of the 1960s in this country and others, you know, tell the story of what, 1968, you know, the big, big year in the story of our, we can tell the story of our own progression and that of culture. We can see the gifts and the shadows of each stage at the integral stage. And when we find people whose center of gravity, and by the way, that's 30% of the people in our country are traditional. 50% at modern. So most people in our country are modern stage. When we find people in our lives whose center of gravity is in one of these stages, we can meet them where they are. And not in a condescending or a patronizing way, in a way that is empathetic and compassionate. The judo move of inclusion is such that I can tell, I can tell the, the views on any given issue of my traditional stage friends and family members in a way that makes them feel seen and heard. Does that make sense? I can talk to my friends in business and, and, and meet them where they are in a way that makes them compassionately and empathetically feel seen and heard. I can talk to my woke 17 year old. I have the wokest, I live with the wokest person on the planet, right? And that's great. I love it that she's that way. She's 17. That's where she's supposed to be. 
I can talk to her in a way that's constructive, that makes her feel seen and heard. My daddy understands me, right? That's, that's the integral capacity. Now, one of the things that's another guiding um, sort of ground rule for this is you can't make anybody grow. You can't make anybody move along the spiral of development. And nobody has to. There's the salvation is not at stake. What we say, no, this is good news. What we say, Amy knows what I'm about to, about to write up here. What we say is that healthy people grow. So everyone, all the 30% here, the 50, the 20, they have a right to be here. We celebrate that they're here. And our wager is that if we can allow people to be healthy here, they will grow. We're not attached to their growth, not our business, we're not God. But healthy people grow. A good portion of this 30% that are they'll die there. That's fine. It's okay. This portion of this 50 percent don't, don't die there. Nobody can be dragged up the spiral. The great problem that's causing the culture wars is that the folks in the progressive stage think that they can drag the traditional stage folks up to their spot. If I tell you often enough and loudly enough about all my progressive views, then at some point I'll wear you out and you'll just come camp out with me. Likewise, my traditional stage folks think if they preach at exhortation, my progressive stage folks often enough and loudly enough, they'll finally wear down and just come on back here and set up home where home has always been. That's always been a fantasy land, right? This is the basic fuel for the culture wars. We're yelling at each other, hoping that if we yell often and loud enough, the other will either grow, regress, whatever. Everybody thinks they're growing, but you, you'll come, come on back. But we don't grow because of exhortation. Human beings grow because we're allowed to develop, because we're living in an environment which is conducive, meaning it's healthy and safe. For development. So when the traditional folks get scared of the progressive folks' policies, they hire a bully. You know who they hire in this country? They hired President Trump. I'm not, I'm not taking a position on his policy. I'm not even saying a partisan political thing. I'm describing something. They got scared. He's not congruent with any of their values. If we're honest, is he? I mean, right? I'm, I'm, again, I'm not criticizing the guy. Just objectively. The traditional stage folks hired a bully to take these folks on. Right? He's a, he's a modernist. With a lot of warrior stage in him, a lot of fight in him. And it was like pouring gasoline on the culture wars. And the answer is not to defeat him with the next one or to keep fighting, right? The answer is to keep growing. So what's fun about this to me is that when I see this map, and it's not a perfect map, it's not Holy Scripture. It didn't fall down out of heaven. It's just a map that's put together over many, many generations and study um, that shows us the basics of the development of human consciousness. And, and remember, each stage is based on agreed upon value sets. Law and order and heritage, liberty and fairness, care and compassion. But I can see that. Then I see my neighbors and my family through a different lens. I see the Bible through a different lens. I see the Apostle Paul through a different lens. 
I see the politicians of our country through a different lens. And then I get to take up the grand adventure, and I'm a major dork on this stuff, of trying to sort of meet them where they are. Like, I'm curious about you. So one of the things that the integralist stage does is that it stops being so critical about everything. It's still in the capacity for criticism, but that becomes less interesting because curiosity has taken over. I'm curious about your, your value set, your perspective, the way you process life. There, you know, and this is going to add up to more than 100%, but, you know, 10% or less in the United States are at the integral stage of consciousness. But it's growing. In our church, we have people all over this map. It's probably not right. It's not, not quite a snapshot of the American sort of medium. You know what I mean by that? But it's it's probably not terribly far off. We've got people whose center of gravity is here, people whose center of gravity is here, people whose center of gravity is here. Probably weights a little bit more towards progressive. I don't know. I'm not. What I love about um, understanding this is I can look out at the crowd and know that all of these stages are represented. And uh, that means we have the opportunity to work together, understanding each other in a different way, meeting each other where each other is. One thing, and then I'll stop and we'll talk. One thing further is, I, you, I kind of have to teach this in a linear way because it just unfolds like that. But there's not a hard line between stages. One teacher says stages are not like architecture, first floor, second floor, third floor. They're like ocean currents. When you're swimming in an ocean, you can feel the current, right? But if you stand on the beach, you can't see the currents. They, they blend together. There's, they're not clean lines. Um, and it's going to keep going. The integral stage of consciousness is not the last stage of consciousness. One of the things that kind of and I've been thinking about lately is my friends who's, who are, whose center of gravity is in traditional stage are particularly resistant to the stage model. Because remember, whatever stage you're in is the only stage. They would prefer me to bring this one out and be just like, oh, here you are. This is it. Everybody get here. But what, here's what interests me about this. And I mean this in a very in a, in a curious way. I think it's fascinating. If this is the final stage of consciousness and the landing spot for evolution, then evolution is stopped. Consciousness is not growing. Uh, the universe is not expanding. We're, we're not learning more quantum physics and more quantum chemistry. It's stopped. But there's an objective glance at a day of the life on planet Earth would say, well, that's just that's just fundamentally not true. It's not, not at all true. Now, I'm not trying to criticize the traditional stage of consciousness. Does that make sense? I'm genuinely curious about it because what I want to be, because fighting doesn't interest me. It, does, it used to, it doesn't interest me anymore. I, just whatever. It's not even now. I got life is short. I don't want to fight with you. I'm curious about you. So I'm curious about <laughs> that reality. If this is the final stage, then evolution stopped 5,000 years ago. And I have to deny an enormous body of scientific evidence, an enormous body of cultural evidence. Um, and that, that just doesn't compute. What does compute to me is that this is true, and this is true, and this is true. And it's true that there are enormous harmful disasters in this stage. It's true that there are enormous harmful disasters in this stage. It's true that there are enormous harmful disasters in each of those stages. And it's true that our that healthy people grow and ours is to transcend and include. So 
this one I'll stop. Questions, comments, thoughts, clarifications. It's a lot. It's an awful lot. Uh, this is a superior example, mm -hmm. but the way that I feel like that transition happens, mm -hmm. it makes me think of a Velveteen Rabbit. Yeah, sure. Which is my favorite. Yeah. But about becoming real. So it's a thing that happens to you. I can't really describe the moment that you were this and now you're this, but it's something that you realize has happened when you arrive at the next place. Yeah, yeah, right. But there's no way you can say, let's achieve this. I'm going to- Yeah, yeah. I'm going to grow today. <laughs> I'm going to transcend my current state of consciousness today. I'm not going to bed until I grow, yeah. Oh, that's like great. You wake up when you stay and you're like, oh, something changed. Right. Yeah, yeah. You can look back. And another principle that's really helpful. And another principle of this is that um, the evolution of consciousness happens on, a, happens on a cultural level. I see your hand raised, Cynthia. We'll just let me say this and then we'll go to you. It happens on a cultural level. So you map it over 300,000 years, right? It happens on a cultural level. The evolution of consciousness through these same stages also happens on an individual level. So we can, each stage is relative to a stage of a human being's life. Like, um, you know, the, arch the archaic stage, that very first one is zero to 18 months, let's say. Remember that, just uh, mother's milk. Only thing that makes sense is, is um, yeah, getting food from mother, getting uh, diapered when I'm crying, getting put down to bed when I'm tired. Um, that, that enchanted tribal stage, again, is, you know, what is it? Two years to eight years, maybe. Believe in the tooth fairy, believe in Santa Claus, the world is magical. Uh, my little family is a clan, and what are our superstitions? What are our things, you know? It's great, it's beautiful. You wouldn't change that for anybody. Warrior stage, teenagers, punk rock music, rap music, gang, you know, all, you know my, currently my, my, uh, my woke teenager wants to pierce like everything. Uh, and it's a little, that's a little holdover from warrior stage where really, I think it could be expressive. Uh, please don't hear me criticizing her. It could be expressive, but also it was kind of rebellious. Like, you know, I, I don't have everything here. So just to, to pierce everything would be to rebel against the home that they're coming. Does, does that sort of make sense? Yeah, it's, it's okay. Um, and then traditional stage, I was a boy scout. I was an Eagle scout, you know, learned all that stuff, uh, 12 to 18, traditional stage. What are the, what are the rules? What's law and order? Um, yeah, and then you can kind of see it going on in the early, you know, late out, late, late teenage years, um, early 20s, up to 30s, up to 35, modern stage, and then, um, you know, progressive stage comes online when you, you know, you date someone whose skin color is different from you, you have, if you're like me growing up where I grew up, you have your first friend who's gay and you realize, oh, well, I, I love you, and what I was taught about this is does not apply in any way to this. Like, you're just a person just like I am, and you no more chose to be gay than I chose to be straight. And does that make sense? And that, that just sort of all comes online um, uh, sort of developmentally. And then one fine day, like like uh, Amy just said, so beautifully, the Velveteen Rabbit's a great one. One fine day, um, I'm making this all sound too simple, by the way. Um, wait, I still love my grandparents. And I still appreciate, like, I appreciate in a new way the heritage. Are you with me? That this whole thing is built on. And I know my grandmother had a different view about some of um, about some of the things that I have a view about because this has awakened me. But that's, she's still legit. Like she's still valid. Like this is still a thing. That kind of and that's kind of that. Cynthia. Oh, well, I just think where would you what and what. Con stage of consciousness would you put understanding of genetics to the point where we can do genetic engineering good because that is a has a lot of interest and yet and it might be considered you know the development evolutionary development on the part of man on the other uh, hand it could be a horror good good Oh, that's that's a great example, actually. Okay, 
So what Cynthia has just done is super helpful. She's given us an issue, right? Genetic uh, manipulation. Okay. So she's given us an issue. We could have any issue, but she's given us that issue, which is great. So what gave us the capacity to manipulate genes? Well, the modern stage. The modern stage of consciousness is where scientific reason comes online. Uh, and it's what got us to the moon. It's what's going to get us um, uh, some kind of revolution that will get us off of fossil fuels. Whatever you, whatever you need solved technologically, that the modern stage is going to do it. So the modern state, think Einstein, right? The modern stage of consciousness uh, is also, by the way, what went, what went all the way back to the Big Bang and figured out how to split an atom, right? Remember that last week? Modern stage of consciousness gave us the capacity to manipulate genes. And maybe the progressive stage of consciousness says, oh, wow, this kind of opens up the field. We can do an awful lot of things. Some of them are good, and some of them we have some questions about. I'm not sure this is all good. So who needs to weigh in? Yep. Traditional stage. Make sense? So the traditional stage needs to weigh in. And it doesn't have to be traditional Judaism or traditional Christianity or traditional like it just traditional stage. The traditional stage has a sense of groundedness in truth, in morality. These other stages have morality and truth too, but there's a grounding here that gave birth to all these. Does that make sense? So the traditional stage needs to weigh in on what modern stage has given us and progressive stages said, yeah, let's, let's kind of kick this thing open, that which is genetic engineering. If we just let these guys have it, I mean, this is shorthand. If we just let modern, the Hendry modern stage consciousness have it, well, how do we make money? <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, well, how do we, let's just keep going, baby, because AI, yeah, that'd be so cool. Like kids with an erector set or programming a computer. The progressive stage is saying, oh, this is going to give, give opportunities to people who don't have opportunities in a way that's incredibly expensive. These two together, holy goodness. There's no telling. That's why we need to include all three. Okay, no, there is, there's a, there's an ethical thing here. Let's do an ethical thing here. No, no, technology is allowing us to do something. Okay, let's make sure we, we're caring and compassionate and to make this available, not just to rich people, but to all people. Does that make sense? So they all check each other. Now, we're not operating like that today. Instead, we're fighting it out and filibustering each other. Oh, Lord. Now, so I want to do, do one thing building on that. There's an integral concept that's sort of a Venn diagram. And, and what, what we do in this is we take an issue. And I've made some notes here, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take the issue, abortion. We'll pick one that's not very controversial, you know? <laughs> that was an intervalist joke. <laughs> okay, so what we do with this Venn diagram exercise is we, we choose an issue, which we've done, and then we're going to take two to four perspectives of, on the issue. So two to four different stances or perspectives on the issue of abortion. And we're going to draw these circles like this. Okay, so the issue is abortion, and we're going to take four perspectives on that issue. This is a little messy, but you'll get the idea. Okay, so one, one perspective or stance on the issue of abortion is that all life is precious. And what we do when we take this stance in our Venn diagram as intervalist is we steel man that issue, that perspective. You know what steel man means? So this is an important concept. Y'all need to be like Charlie. Y'all need to be like Charlie and walk out of the room. Uh, I'll, I'll stop in a minute because I got to go upstairs. Okay, so you have two different concepts. One is straw man, and one is steel man. Anybody familiar with these concepts? Okay, straw man. So let's say Evie and I, we would never do this, but let's say we're arguing. Evie and I are arguing, and um, Evie's got me pegged, and she knows how to beat me. She's going to straw man me. She's going to say, Henry believes X about the issue of abortion. And then she's going to um, really flesh that out about how I believe X about the issue of abortion. She's even going to have a part of a quote of mine. 
that's going to support her straw man argument against me. The trouble is, it's not true. She's taking the quote out of context, which she would never do. And um, she's saying things that I don't believe. She's setting up a straw man for one purpose, so she can knock it down. Make sense? So I'm going to argue, you're like, 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 I'm going to argue against you. I'm going to say all these things that Elizabeth believes. I'm going to have a quote of hers put in there, and I'm only setting her up. She doesn't get to weigh in, by the way. I've never been venue where she would weigh in because I'm straw manning her. I'm setting it up so I can knock her down. This is the go-to, bless their hearts. I love them, y'all. I do, of our politicians today. They just straw man each other. It's not even interesting anymore. Who cares? What is interesting to me is steel man. All right. So Evie is now going to steel man me. So she spends time with me and she gets curious about what I actually believe. She uses an actual quote from me in context. When I hear it, I say, I did say that. That is what I believe. And Evie makes my argument for me. She learns my perspective out of curiosity, love, and compassion to such a degree that she can issue my argument better than I can. In fact, I'm like, oh, Elizabeth, you want to know what I think? Just talk to Evie. She steel mans me. It's a beautiful, positive move. Does that make sense? So when we're making our back to our bend name diagram. So this is bad. This is awesome. Can you imagine if Joe and Donald just steel man each other? <laughs> Y'all would change the whole country. It would change the whole country. So no, no, I understand what he's saying about the border. No, I get it. Let, let me, I'll, I'll explain what he says about the border. You know, can you imagine if they did that to each other? Steel man each other? Anyway, so we steal in our Venn diagram, we steel man the life, all life is precious perspective. We use scripture. We use a uh, uh, real life, heavily emotional stories. Like we've got our own experience to describe and illustrate. Steel man and life is precious. Okay, the next perspective we put on abortion in our um, Venn diagram is that bodily autonomy is a basic human freedom. Make sense? Bodily autonomy is a basic human freedom. And then we steel man the heck out of that. I don't want anybody telling me what to do with my body, and I respect her right as that. And we just you got tons of science, tons of ethics, tons of philosophy. Steel man the heck out of it. Bodily autonomy is a basic human freedom. The next one we put in here is a fetus becomes more human over time. Right? So we steel man that. A fetus starts as a cell, then a cluster of cells, and it grows, and it grows, and it grows, and it grows. And over time, this is just science, it grows, right? It becomes what we might characterize as more human over time. And we steel man the heck out of that position. These are four of thousands of positions we can take on abortion, right? And then the fourth one we're going to put in our Venn diagram is that economic suffering is real. Issues abortion, economic suffering is real. And we steal man the heck out of that. Uh, abortion, uh, let's see, prohibitive abortion laws um, disproportionately affect the economically disadvantaged. So, you know, economic suffering is real. We steal man the heck out of that. Right? So we've taken, I've just taken four. You could, you could do another four, you could do, you know, whatever. So from the edible perspective, we steel man all of these. And then we say, you know what? Each of those, now that we've steel man them, I've gotten really curious. Each of those has got something to say. Each of those perspectives has got something to say that's valuable. I don't actually want anybody to leave the party. I think each, each one of these people perspectives, so the integral schools will say, we, this is terribly messy, we can be here. And it's not compromise, and it's not wishy-washy. It's legitimately, because we didn't straw man or make anything up. We steel man all of these. No, this is Amy's position. This is Edie's position. It's Henry's position. It's Brian's position. And I steel man them all. I am curious about them. I, I can give their position paper better than they can. And we can be here. We can be right here. 
You could do this on the border. You could do this on the death penalty. You could do this on, um, you know, racism. You could do it on anything. But fundamental thing that the integral perspective says is that everyone has something to bring to the park. And we ought to help to bring to the park. I'm not interested any longer much in how we disagree. I want to know what you think. And I want to steal man you in a beautiful, fun way. Like, all right, tell me, Elizabeth, I want, give me your stuff on abortion. I want to learn it better than you do. So you feel seen and heard, and then I can include your perspective in mine. And then pray, God, you would be as curious about me as I am about you. Wow, Cynthia, that was a long answer to your question, but that's my answer to your question. <laughs> and that Venn diagram is really is a great exercise. Um, it's easy for me to just knee jerk tell you what I think about whatever. But I'll grow after I steal man all the positions that we can come up with and realize that it's kind of like Velveteen Rabbit, right? And it's like, oh, wait, I actually, I'm in the middle. I'm, I got a little piece of all of these. In me. Well, when you can defend the validity and understand that's real. Yeah. yeah. And there's no babies that can be thrown out. There you go. Like, no, but they're not mutually exclusive. Yeah. There's a just because this is true doesn't mean that's not true. There's a lived tension. Yeah. 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 And you know, we we didn't get to this today. But if you go, so we could, so this is I'm always refining this, y'all. You're you're a part of my evolution. So um, I'll, that'll be my self-conscious sort of apology and disclaimer. But let's say we put, what does it mean to be saved? What does it mean to be saved? We could put, what does it mean to be saved through each of these filters and come up with a different. Um, so actually, we could do it real quick. What does it mean to be saved? Believe in Jesus Christ, he died for your sins, sins of the world, uh, learn the creed, and you're saved. If you're not, you're going to hell. Traditional. Gross oversimplification. Modern stage. What did Thomas Jefferson do with the Bible? He cut out all the words. Modern stage is like, there's no saved. Are you kidding? You just die. Dust to dust means death. Done. No supernatural. Red Sea didn't part. Progressive stage says, um, didn't, you know. Every, everybody's saved. Yeah. Super helpful. And I wouldn't say, I really wouldn't say no to any of those. I'd say, oh yeah, let's make a Venn diagram. <laughs> Seriously, I can argue for this one. Oh, heck yeah. I got a 12-year-old, y'all. You better believe we got some law and order, some rights and wrongs, some do's and don'ts. I got some, I, I'm the I'm the priest who's interested in the big bang. Are you kidding? Absolutely. And uh, I'm also love is all, of course. It's it's not. I can't compute with hell. It doesn't, it doesn't make any sense to me because the progressive stage of consciousness is fully alive, and they and you can't put the toothpaste back in the tube. It's not going back. It's not going back. Um, with my story today in the sermon, and you don't have to have heard the sermon, but I told the story the story of the sermon today, and I didn't teach uh, integral theory in it. But if you listen to the story that I told, I had three different responses to that story. And I really wasn't doing this on purpose, but I looked back at it because I was thinking about teaching this class. The three different responses correspond to these three different stages of how I respond to this, this story that I told in the sermon. One of them is very traditional. I told from the perspective of a parent. Um, one of them is told from the modern stage of consciousness where I talk about the disease model. I don't talk about this, but I'm expressing my understanding of the disease model of addiction, which takes over one's capacity to choose. Very, without the modern stage of consciousness. By the way, AA is a very traditional stage of consciousness. Alcoholics Anonymous is a height of American traditional stage of consciousness, 12 steps, with a modern gift given back to it. The disease model of addiction informs the 12 steps. Anyway, and then, then the, the, my, the punchline of my story is from a, 
again, I couldn't do that on purpose, but I, looking back, I could see, oh yeah, and then the, the, the conclusion that I come to is, is because of this progressive stage of consciousness, this caring capacity that's lit up in me. Oh, that, that I blame on Jesus. Or credit Jesus. What else is in there? Kathy, you've heard me teach this a hundred times. What, how are we doing? Anything coming to your mind? Other than he needs to shorten that teaching, which is true. No, I just think about, uh, I live in a very small town in East Tennessee, yeah. and I feel like I'm always in the middle of the culture wars. And because I am a, a affiliated with a business, a business, business ownership, I think people put, put me in that box a yeah. lot. And um, I don't know, that's just, that's just what I'm thinking. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's very careful. You have to be very careful not to think you know where somebody is. That's right. That's helpful, Kathy, and, that, and that, that's a really good reminder that there's another principle of integral theory. There are not types of people. There are types in people. So these stages of consciousness, I don't have traditional stage friends. I have friends whose center of gravity seems to be in the traditional stage of consciousness. It seems that they have the traditional stage as the primary stage operating in them. So the integralist is finally compassionate. It doesn't want to label. And this, by, by the way, this is a very progressive stage too. I don't want to label people as traditional, modern, or progressive. You just have these things in us. And everything, as we go through a stage, the stage stays in us. When I'm dealing with my 12-year-old on rules, this lights up in me. And by the way, this goes out the door. It really dims. No, I don't. No, but how are people right? You're 12. <laughs> Do the dishes. Is that, that going to make sense? And by the way, if someone breaks into my house at night, that happens. I mean, right? I mean, people stole my next neighbor's car. Someone breaks into my house at night or comes in here trying to hurt one of you. You know what? You know what's going to light up in me? This. I'll be very serious. Somebody comes in here right this second and tries to hurt somebody, then all of us will probably have this light up in us. Or I know I will. I said I'll win. I'm not like some kind of tough guy. But this instinct that's still in me will light up. I worked as a firefighter for a number of years. And this really served me well because it's that, that, that real vigorous inner egocentric self that would charge into a fire. Well, tra trained in all this, but would charge into danger to be helpful. Does that make sense? So these all stay online. Um, I had to really pull this one up last week when I was studying the four forces of nature that, you know, occurred at the, in the millisecond after the Big Bang. Anyway, you, you can, they all stay, transcendent and include, transcendent and include. This is pretty good, isn't it, Amy? So I, I like this. Um, if the progressives, bad as hell, traditional stage, right? I'm anthropomorphizing the stages, you'll forgive me. And so it says, if we can only get around and follow the traditional state folks, all those people who voted for Donald Trump, we can get rid of them, everything be okay. So the progressive stage gets rid of the, let's say, waves of magic wand. Isn't this fun, Kathy? Gets rid of these two stages. <laughs> and I'm left with these cats. Let me tell you something. You don't want to be alone with these people. <laughs> I'm, I'm being silly to make the point, but you don't sound like, no, 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 no. You, you actually don't want to make friends with the warlords in the prison system in Los Angeles. We love them. I mean, I pray, but you don't, uh-uh. Does that, is that kind of, does that sound too bad, or do you kind of get the, the point? I've been a little playful. Um, ISIS is not, they, you can't love them into reform. You remember A Few Good Men? You remember that movie, A Few Good Men? You remember when Jack Nicholson, Nicholson, is that his name? Nicholson? Nicholas. Nicholson. One's a golfer, one's an actor. The guy that's an actor. Nicholson. You remember the, the, the line of a few good men, which the whole thing hinged. You want me on that wall. Y'all remember that? His job was to, was, he was guarding Guantanamo Bay or something like that. Wherever he was guarding. He was guarding um, 
is keeping dangerous people out. You want me on that wall. Now, there's a lot of downside to that. I'm not, I'm not idolizing that perspective or that, but there's some, he was giving expression to the warrior stage. That, that we can't get rid of. And it was, it was expressed in that movie, a fictional movie on the traditional um, manifestation of armed forces. There's a place for these things. Everybody has something to bring to the party. Likewise, well, let's be honest. Let's be honest about the disasters too. How do we get to a friendly place with each other where we can name our disasters and be honest about it? Because we want to transcend and include the best, not the worst. Integral spirituality sees that this is a thing. And the future of the tradition is evolutionary. So let's not waste any time fighting. How do we build bridges from stage to stage to stage? Is that it? Did we get there? All of this is just the start. If you're interested, keep chasing the rabbit. Reach out to me. I'll give you some more resources. If you're not interested, don't. It's all good. Thanks for being here today. Peace, y'all. Thank you. Thank you.